If we experience in ourselves a condition in which we remember nothing between the moments percepted as when we fall into a dreamless sleep, we reach a state in which our soul does not perceptibly differ from a bare moment. But as a state has an end when we stand up, Leibniz conceives our soul to be more than a bare monad. In the state of sleep, the simple substance is still not without perception. It cannot continue to exist without being affected in some way, and this affection is nothing but its perception. Perception is conceived by Leibniz as something active, a quite modern view similar to constructivism. Imagine this metronome as being percepting rather than acting. When there is a great multitude of perceptions, one is stunned like somebody turning round and round at fast pace. By percepting too many little perceptions, we might not be able to distinguish anything anymore. Every present state of a monad is naturally a consequence of its preceding state. One perception can in a natural way come only from another perception, like one swing of the pendulum rod follows the previous swing. Motion can come in a natural way only from motion. If we had in our perception nothing marked, we should always be in the state of stupor. This is a state in which bare monads are for Leibniz. Memory provides a soul with a kind of consecutiveness which resembles reason. If animals have a perception of something which caused them harm before, they remember and howl or run away if they are confronted with it again. The resulting action is dependent on the quantity or quality of previous perceptions considering this. As the concatenation of the perceptions is due to the principle of memory alone, men act like animals. In Leibniz's time, people expected the sun to rise the next day because they were used to it. It was only the astronomers who thought it on rational grounds. It is the knowledge of necessary and eternal truth that distinguishes us from the mere animal gives us reason and the sciences, raising us to the knowledge of ourselves and God. Leibniz calls this in us the rational soul or mind, as en Francais. Also through this knowledge we rise to acts of reflection, which lets us think of what is called I. To observe that this or that is within us lets us think of being, of substance, of the thimble and the compound, the immaterial of God, conceiving that what is limited in us is in him without limits. These acts of reflection furnish the chief objects of our reasonings. Reasoning is grounded on two main principles. First, contradiction. This is what we judge false, that what involves a contradiction, and true, that which is opposed or contradictory to the false. The second is the principle of sufficient reason. This means there can be no fact real or existing, no statement true, unless there be a sufficient reason why it should be so and not otherwise. There are also two kinds of truth, those of reasoning and those of fact. Truth of reasoning are necessary and their opposite is impossible. Truth of fact are contingent and their opposite is possible. The apple could fall up and not down. The reason for necessary truth can be found by analysis, resolving it into more simple ideas and truth until we come to those which are primary. It is thus that in mathematics speculative theorems and practical canons are reduced by analysis to definitions, axioms and postulates. But there must also be a sufficient reason for counting in truth or truth of fact, that is to say, for the sequence or connection of the things which are dispersed throughout the universe of created beings, in which the analyzing into particular reasons might go on into endless detail because of the immense variety of things in nature and the infinite division of bodies. There is an infinity of present and past forms and motions which go to make up the efficient cause of my present talking, and there is an infinity of minute tendencies and dispositions of my soul which go to make its final cause.